Since Greek times, it has been believed in Western science and philosophy that the world is consistent. Indeed, uh, logical consistency with axioms has been the bedrock of modern thinking. However, in both Vedic and Buddhist philosophy, which constitute the basis of practically all Eastern thinking, many of these fundamental ideas about logic and consistency have been disputed. For example, in the depiction of yin and yang in Taoist philosophy, the classical contradiction between opposites such as black and white is not accepted. Rather, there is black inside white and there is white inside black. One way to understand this white inside black is to think of the concept of color, which is both immanent and transcendent to white and black. It is transcendent because there are other colors beyond white and black. It is also immanent because white and black are colors. So when you see the two colors, there is a sense in which the property of color is present in white and black, and yet it is not exhausted by white and black. Since color includes white and black, when color is imminent, then black enters white and white enters black. The reason is that color is in white and black is in color. So black is inside white. The key idea here is that color is both imminent and transcendent to white and black. As a transcendent entity, it includes all colors, and as an imminent entity, those other colors conceptually enter inside the individual color. Therefore, even though white and black are separate colors, through the concept of color, they become interrelated, due to which you cannot truly separate anything from anything else in the classical logical sense. Western thinking has been torn in between these extremes of immanence and transcendence. <clears throat> in Platonic philosophy, the forms are transcendent, and in Aristotle's philosophy, they are immanent. In modern set theory, the set includes the object, but the object doesn't include the set. This was the basic point of Russell's theory of types, in which he constructed a hierarchy of concepts to get rid of the paradoxes of set theory. However, you cannot get rid of this paradox because language operates in two modes as universals and particulars. You can call the universal concept of barbers by the word barber, and you can also call the individual barber by the same word barber. So the only way you can solve this problem is by changing language and use one language for concepts and the other language for individuals. And by that so-called solution, you will end up with a mind-body problem in which concepts are in one world and matter is in another world. So the basic problem throughout Western philosophy and science has been this dual nature of ideas, which are both immanent and transcendent. And because the West could not deal with this problem, they created a world of duality in which two things are either identical or independent, but not related via immanence. The separation or identity is what constitutes Western logic. And it is a false idea because it is built upon the notion that the idea color is not immanent in the individual colors, black and white. In a simple sense, the need for alternative mathematics arises from this dual nature of concepts as both immanent and transcendent, because it creates a logical contradiction. There are two apparently contradictory statements in the Bhagavad Gita. In the verse 6.30, Krishna says that for one who sees everything in me, and me in everything, I am never lost to him, nor is he lost to me. So here Krishna is saying that he is both immanent and transcendent. Then in verse 7.12, he says that everything is manifested from me, but I am not in this manifestation. Here he says that he is transcendent, but not imminent. This contradiction again comes in the verse 9.4, 
where Krishna says, by me in my unmanifested form, this entire universe is pervaded. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. Here Krishna says that I am in everything as Abhyakta Murti or unmanifest form. And this is a Murti or a form, so even the pervasive form of God is not impersonal. Prabhupada explains in the purport that God is everywhere, but he is invisible to the senses. But by loving devotion he becomes manifest and then we can see how God is eminent. So mukti or liberation means that we see the transcendent form of God in the spiritual world. But bhakti means that we see that imminent form of God even in the material world. In many schools of Vaishnavism, the idea of mukti is rejected. Sri Chaitanya says, Mama janmani janmani shware bhavatad bhaktir ahetuki tvai, which means, birth after birth I desire your devotion. Repeated birth means I am in the material world, so I am not seeing the transcendent form. Then how can I see God? It is because God is imminent. When we love God, then we can see that imminent representation in the soul. So advanced devotees say that they have captured God in their heart and he cannot leave. In many places in Vedic texts, it is described that there are two primordial entities, namely God and his energy or Shakti. This energy or Shakti is like a mirror in which God sees himself. And when he sees, there is a representation of God inside the mirror. So the God looking into the mirror is transcendent. The reflected representation inside the mirror is imminent. And there is mutual attraction between God and his Shakti. So as long as this attraction exists, there is a reflection inside the mirror. But the transcendent form of God is not that reflection. So in one sense he is transcendent and yet imminent. You can also put this idea in a different way by saying that in each individual thing, the ideal thing is imminent. This ideal is called Paramatma, who exists inside each atom. However, as things become non-ideal, this ideal form is hidden so it becomes abhyakta or unmanifest. It is like a dirty mirror in which you cannot see the image. So when we cleanse the mirror, which is called Cheto Darparmarjanam, or cleansing the mirror of Chitta, then the image is visible. The Paramatma form in the material atoms is temporary because the material world is temporary. However, in Srimad Bhagavatam it is said that the Absolute Truth is understood in three ways as Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. The Bhagavan form is transcendent. The Paramatma form is immanent and Brahman is when God and his Shakti are not individuated, so immanence and transcendence don't arise. Thus the term Paramatma is used to describe the immanent form in matter or immanent in the soul. The form immanent in the soul is eternal but the one in matter is temporary. As transcendent individual God contains or as parts all the living entities. But as an imminent individual, he is inside all those parts. So even though the parts are different from the whole, they are not completely separated from him. Indeed, this idea that the parts are separated from the whole is called the illusion of material world. The problem of imminence and transcendence is ultimately a spiritual problem. But we can state this problem in secular terms as the problem of concepts. It is this one problem that appears in many forms in logic, mathematics, physics, and all other areas of science. This problem has also been debated for centuries in the Vedic tradition as part of Vedanta philosophy. The Advaita system says that we should get rid of this idea that there are parts and just consider the whole. The Dvaita system says that the whole is indeed separate from the part but it is not completely separable. 
and there are many different schools which iterate over this theme in different ways. Sri Chaitanya articulated this idea of Achintya Bheda Bhe Tattva in which the whole and the part are separate and inseparable. And because this is a contradictory idea, you cannot articulate it in classical logic. However, the issue is that if we cannot understand it, then every other thing is unknowable. Since every problem involves concepts which are imminent and transcendent. So by saying that this is achintya, which means inconceivable, all knowledge becomes impossible. Therefore, we must transcend classical logic and then the achintya can become chintya. The essence of this tradish transition is that there are three kinds of relations between the whole and the part. I call these relations is a, has a and wants a. For example, the concept color has a color called black. This is the re relation from color to black. However, the inverse relation from black to color is different. It is an is a relation where we can say that black is a color. The has a relation leads to transcendence and the is a relation leads to immanence. And then there is a relation of mutuality of wants in which there is a mutual attraction between the whole and the part. If this attraction is removed, then the other two relations are also removed and we think that there is no whole, there are just parts and these parts are independent of each other and that ultimately leads to reductionism and materialism. So when I speak about an alternative logic, I mean that we must describe this tripartite relation between whole and part. Since there are three aspects of the relation, it appears to be inconsistent if you think of the relation as only one thing. In classical logic, for instance, when we describe a relation R between two entities A and B, then this R doesn't have parts or aspects. But we are talking about a relation that has three aspects. One aspect results in immanence, another aspect in transcendence, and the third aspect in mutuality. In one sense, this is a solution to millennia of outstanding problems. In another sense, it is also the answer to the debates within Vedanta philosophy. If we can solve this problem with the scheme that I outlined, then we can bring a new view or understanding to both science and religion.